Well, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's a very busy time of the year. I'm uh, Greg Scarlatti, Executive Director of the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, HRNK. If you're here today to talk about impeachment, you are at the wrong conference. <laughs> today we're launching our new report, Digital Trenches, North Korea's Information Counteroffensive. HRNK was established in 2001 by a group of distinguished policy experts, scholars, private sector representatives, former government officials. We are fortunate to have several of our board members uh, on the panel giving introductory remarks today. Uh, our organization has followed three main lines of investigation and research. Um, North Korea's unlawful detention facilities, its political prison camps. We continue to follow very closely North Korean regime dynamics and its impact on North Korea's policy of human rights denial and most vulnerable groups, um, trafficked women, children. This fall season has been a very productive one and I would like to thank many of you for having joined us for all three events. We launched a report on the organization guidance department, Bob Collins, one on North Korea's children, Court Robinson, Lost Generation. And today we are here to launch um, an extraordinary breakthrough report by um, author Martin Williams. Uh, we are very fortunate to have such a great speaker lineup and we are also very fortunate that um, our most distinguished speaker who will be giving our introductory remarks today has just returned from the West Coast. Um, we are very uh, blessed and lucky to have the Honorable Robert King, former U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues on HRNK's board. The former and only South Korean Human Rights Ambassador, North Korean Human Rights Ambassador, Ambassador Lee Jong-hun is also on our board. I joke about it, we have more North Korean Human Rights Ambassadors on our board than the U.S. and South Korean governments combined. Ambassador Robert King um, has, um, has been a, a champion and scholar of human rights, of American values, freedom, and democracy for many years. For many years, he was known as uh, Chief of Staff to the late Congressman uh, Tom Lantos. Um, we, of course, remember that Tom Lantos was uh, the only Holocaust survivor to ever sit in the U.S. Congress. Ambassador King also served as Democratic Staff Director and Staff Director of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, he was Senior Analyst at Radio Free Europe as well, very knowledgeable, not only of Asia Pacific, Korean Peninsula issues, but of course also Eastern Europe all along his most distinguished career. I do not mean to, to steal any of the speaker's thunder, but I was born and raised in Romania. 30 years ago, I was in the midst of the changes there. Without going into further details, I think that the, this event is extraordinarily timely. That said, Ambassador King, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm glad Greg mentioned our connection. Uh, we've known each other, Greg and I have known each other for over a decade uh, since I became special envoy 10 years ago. Uh, Greg mentioned uh, that he was born in Romania. He graduated from high school about 30 years ago. Uh, and 30 years ago, Nicolae Ceausescu was the leader of Romania. Uh, next week, December 25th, marks the 30th anniversary of the execution of Ceausescu in Romania. Uh, he was killed by a military force, his own military force, which had captured him as he was attempting to flee Bucharest. The uprising in Romania at the time the Berlin Wall came down, at the time uh, the Velvet Revolution occurred in Czechoslovakia. Romania had the only violent overthrow of the communist regime in Central Europe. Uh, after Ceausescu was found guilty, 
his soldiers executed him, and I can still remember the photographs on television and in the newspaper of Ceausescu and his wife Elena uh, lying in the snow where they were executed 30 years ago. Uh, as Greg mentioned, I spent some time at Radio Free Europe. Uh, when I was at doing, finishing my uh, graduate work, uh, I had used a lot of resources that Radio Free Europe had in terms of its research operation. And when they offered me a job, uh, it was not just the attraction of living in Munich, it was the opportunity to follow what was going on in Central Europe. And Radio Free Europe played a very important role in terms of what happened in Central Europe uh, 30 years ago right now. Uh, Surg Radio, radio which attempts to take the place of a free radio that did not exist in the countries of Central Europe. Uh, the radios broadcast for some 40 years uh, during the period from the beginning of the Cold War until 1989 and when they uh, gradually began to, uh, to fade. A recent study of Radio Free Europe and uh, sister broadcaster Radio Liberty, which broadcast to the Soviet Union, came to a very positive assessment about the importance of radio broadcasting and information in terms of the transformation that took place in Central Europe. Uh, the RAND study says, in the long term, U.S. broadcasts had a powerful impact upon elite and public opinion of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Evidence documented by external and internal audience surveys, elite testimony from people like former President Václav Havel, and the magnitude of communist regime countermeasures against Radio Free Europe broadcasts all indicate the significant impact that radio broadcasts had. Many historians regard U.S. information and cultural policies as one of the key reasons for the West's victory in the Cold War. Western information programs achieved a remarkable degree of success during the Cold War, which was achieved at a very low cost in national security terms. Unfortunately, North Korea is even more complicated and difficult an information environment than Central Europe was three decades ago. The North Korean government of Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un, and uh, Kim Il-sung was more ruthless and more brutal than even the Nikolai Ceausescu regime in Romania. Fortunately, the Committee on Human Rights in North Korea has taken a very leading role in terms of documenting and informing us about what's been going on in uh, North Korea in terms of the human rights situation today. The information environment in North Korea is changing, and we're very fortunate to have this excellent report that Martin Williams has produced for us today. And I look forward very much to hearing Martin's comments on what's happening and how it has changed. And I urge all of you to read very carefully the report that he has prayed, prepared which talks about these issues and this problem. I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have today, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here and see what's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador King. I would now like to invite our panelists to be seated. And Mike Top, please join me up on stage. Uh, Taking this opportunity, I'd also like to welcome Suzanne Scholte, uh, co-vice chair of the board at HRNK. Great to see you, Suzanne. I know how busy you are around this time of the year. Thank you for being here. Um, speaking of, uh, of the firing squad that Ambassador King was mentioning, I'm actually Facebook friends with one of the three members of the firing squad that shot the Ceausescu, as I can introduce you if you're interested. Um, this report by uh, Martin Williams is an HRNK first. Um, information uh, is an area that is extraordinarily important. And of course, HRNK plays the role of a think tank, 
a research institution, of course, we do not have the capabilities, the personnel, the know-how, the, the history to enable us to engage in information operations, the, the role that we're beginning to play is that of analyzing North Korea's information environment, hoping to produce helpful analysis and recommendations for organizations that are practically right now on the, um, on the battlefront. And thus, we came up with the idea of talking to Martin Williams, who is uh, very well known as an expert in North Korean technology. He brings a very unique set of skills to the world of human rights and North Korea policy. I'm sure that many of you have been readers of his and followers of his North Korea tech website. Uh, Martin agreed to look primarily at three areas, but of course he'll tell you much more about this. So basically, the technology employed, the content employed in North Korea's efforts to repel information coming in from the outside world. Martin Williams also looked at some of the legal aspects, laws employed um, in the process, and also extrajudicial punishment employed in the process. Martin is currently based in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area on the West Coast. He spent a long time in Japan, 16 years. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, good morning. Thank you all for coming today. Um, and thanks to HRNK for the opportunity to, to do this research and publish this report. Um, one of my hopes is that uh, this leads to uh, more people getting interested in this area, doing more research, and us uh, sort of taking this forward as well. Um, I thought I'd start this morning uh, just by talking a little bit about what I think are some of the more interesting findings. Uh, some of what I'm going to say, uh, possibly some of you already know, so I apologize if I'm sort of preaching to the converted. Uh, but I, I'm also conscious that there might be some people here that don't know very much, so um, uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to go over some background as well. Um, so the, the first thing is, uh, you know, something that we know, that over the last uh, couple of decades, the amount of foreign information flowing into North Korea has been increasing and increasing. Uh, and it's rapidly got to the point now where it's estimated that most North Koreans have had or continue to have access to at least some form of foreign content. Uh, North Korea has, of course, always considered this content illegal. If it doesn't come through the, the sizable propaganda or censorship apparatus of the Workers' Party, then North Koreans aren't permitted to uh, read it or access it or distribute it. Uh, so what I'm looking at is how the state has responded to this inflow of information in this report. Uh, we started off earlier this year in Seoul. Uh, we interviewed 42 escapees um, as part of the report, and they're quoted throughout. Um, we also, I also relied on some prior surveys of escapees, uh, books and, and other reports that have been written about North Korea, um, a couple of decades of state media articles and reporting, and a library of uh, North Korean TV coverage as well to come up with, uh, with the report. Uh, and it's divided into several uh, sort of basic sections. The first one looks, um, as, as Greg said, at the, the law and the legal response to all of this. Uh, and I start by looking at the North Korean criminal code. Um, I was fortunate that, that HRNK was able to provide the 2009, 2012, and 2015 versions of the code. And by comparing them, we can see that the laws concerning foreign content and information have been evolving. Um, there has been a shift in emphasis away from large or away from heavy um, uh, sentences for consumers into distributors and people who are trafficking in particularly uh, what the state regards as particularly egregious forms of content. Uh, in the North Korean context then, um, in addition to distribution, that's anyone that's distributing things that directly attack the regime, the system, its leaders, anything that's political or any type of pornography. Uh, now, while penalties have been increasing for the smugglers, uh, it's important though to note that just as penalties have been reduced for consumers, consumers can still get into a lot of trouble for simply possessing some of this media. So uh, it's not that the government is necessarily giving up. I think what it is is it's more of a uh, reaction by the government that they realize they're losing this war. Uh, they can't prosecute everybody. They can't put everybody in jail because there are just too many people that have this now. 
Uh, it's a little bit, if you like, um, you know, similar to uh, what you'll see in some countries with, say, a war on a particular type of drug or something. At first, you'll prosecute people that have it, but eventually you'll go to the distributors and things like that and the people that are making it because you can't prosecute everybody with it. It's a big problem, and you need to go to the source. Uh, so that's what we see happening with the laws in North Korea. Um, the, uh, so the sentences for distributing uh, content have been getting longer. And if you look in the report, I've reproduced the, uh, the three or four laws that cover this and the uh, relevant parts from 2019, 12, and 2015, so you can see the differences and how the sentences are changing. Uh, but of course, this is North Korea. And you know, while the letter of the law does indicate that uh, you know, some of the government's thinking, the letter of the law isn't something that always the, the state goes by. Uh, so even though none of the North Korean laws concerning foreign content offer execution as a sentence, that is something that's still used today. Uh, I'm sure many of you read the uh, UN Commission of Inquiry report in 2014. Uh, that concluded that almost every North Korean has um, witnessed an execution in their lifetime. Uh, today, for foreign content, execution still appears to be in use, especially where it does involve large-scale distribution or anti-regime material, um, even though, like I said, it's not actually in one of the sentences. So uh, while the law gives us this indication of maybe the way the government's thinking, it, it isn't the be-all and end-all. Uh, sort of going along with that and the way that the law is enforced, um, in recent years, there has been an explosion in bribery in North Korea. Uh, and this is especially true, uh, I heard from escapees, um, if, when they're caught with foreign content, if they're dealing with local level police or security services. It gets more difficult to bribe as it gets to provincial level or national level um, authorities. Uh, the reason's simple, as the state economy has weakened, even the security forces are feeling the pinch. And hand in hand with the weakening of the state economy is, of course, the rise of the markets. And the rise of the markets is giving a few people private wealth, which they didn't have before. So now you have much poorer security forces, and you have people they're catching with a lot of money. So of course, bribery is, is beginning to uh, flourish. Uh, one escapee even told me that they're sure that the reason that senior security forces go on house raids uh, is because they simply want to extort bribes from people. Uh, the bribes um, I heard of range from anything from a few dollars to uh, one person that said uh, the bribe was over $1,000. Uh, if you think about the state salary of, what, 50 cents a month or something like that, uh, this is a massive amount of money. But of course, if you have private wealth, uh, this becomes something that is, is slightly more doable. And we also heard from many escapees that if someone gets caught, they will reach out to their entire family and friends and everyone will pull together to come up with the, the bribe because <coughs> the content's been shared between all these people. And if, those, if the, the family members and the friends don't get them out of uh, questioning as soon as possible, they're likely to spill the names of everybody. So there's a, a sort of community interest in getting all the money together to get these people out, to get the bribe paid. Um, on the one hand, then, this can, this can, the, the sort of rise in uh, the amount of foreign content and the way that people can now bribe their way out of trouble could be seen as positive uh, because it, less people are, are now going to jail for it. Uh, but uh, one of the things to remember is that only a small number of people in North Korea do have a lot of money. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, we sort of risk seeing in North Korea is maybe the establishment of a two-tier system where the rich can in continue to enjoy foreign content because they can bribe their way out of trouble and the poor can't because uh, they, they either have to suffer jail or they can't afford the bribes. Uh, when it comes to catching people, uh, some of the old methods like street inspections and house raids are still being used. Uh, but these days when there's a street inspection as well as checking someone's pockets, they'll also ask for a cell phone and they'll ask for the password for the cell phone as to go through the cell phone. They'll look at uh, pictures on the cell phone. They'll look at videos on the cell phone. Uh, they'll look at chat messages that you've been sending to your friends, both to see what you've been talking about, but also to see the kind of language you've been using that might indicate if you're using some uh, you know, South Korean colloquialisms or something like that. So people have to be very careful with what they're doing with their smartphones. Uh, escapees said that the refusal to hand over your phone will result in its confiscation and then it gets uh, examined even more closely. And uh, there was a recent report, I think Daily NK had a recent report, um, that said that the police have started to employ uh, data recovery experts that now will look through phones for deleted files to see what you've taken off your phone. So the, the state, is, uh, the state is, is sort of becoming aware of what people are doing and they're responding in that way. 
Now, most of the content we're talking about here um, that's being distributed in North Korea, of course, comes over the border with China. And uh, since Kim Jong-un came to power, many people talked about a build-up in border forces, uh, cha regular changing of border guards. Uh, this is uh, one way the government's trying to stop bribery. Uh, by swapping the border guards out, uh, making them change their location so they don't become friends with local citizens. And then in the last couple of years, the surveillance camera network has gone into force along most of the border. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's probably there to uh, watch the border, to stop people trying to cross. Um, but I suspect also in today's North Korea, uh, it's also there so that the, uh, the senior folks in the security service can, can watch and see what their, own, um, what their own officers are doing on the border. Um, either to make sure that their officers aren't involved in bribery or if they are involved in bribery, to, to make note it and, and make sure that they get a cut when the officers come back to base. Uh, so that's the sort of legal and law enforcement area that I looked at and some of the reactions. Uh, another uh, area was the uh, ideological response, how North Korea was responding to this in its own messaging to its people. Uh, and of course, um, you know, foreign content represents this huge threat to the regime um, from birth, as we all know, North Koreans are conditioned to have nothing but loyalty for the leaders and for the party and for the system. Uh, so anything that gives them the ability to, to think in a different method, uh, to think in a different way, is an incredible threat to, to the state and to the regime. Uh, in state-run media, the propaganda comes through songs and documentaries, news, articles, everything about the Kim family. Um, if you watch state television, one of the things you'll notice, though, is that they don't talk very much about foreign content. In fact, they never spend any time saying you shouldn't watch foreign content. They never spend any time reporting on people that have been arrested for distributing foreign content or being caught with it. None of this is covered in state television. None of it is, is covered in the uh, state radio networks. And the reason for that is because state TV and state radio we can receive overseas. Uh, so state TV continues to be this sort of propaganda beacon for a perfect nation. Uh, nothing bad about North Korea is ever carried in state television. Uh, but inside the country, in places where we can't readily monitor, this is where a lot of the uh, efforts go on to stop people consuming foreign content. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most uh, uh, common methods is in the uh, weekly meetings that, that all North Koreans have to go to on Saturday mornings. Um, many people said that quite often uh, there would be officials from the Ministry of Public Security that would come and would lecture them about the evils of foreign content and talk to them about uh, the penalties they might face if they get caught, uh, dressing a particular way, using certain words. A lot of this is going on these in these meetings that can't get monitored outside of the country. Uh, and the other way the North Koreans do this is in the, the so-called third radio network. Uh, now, this is the uh, radio system that goes into the speakers that are installed in people's houses. And uh, when I came into this report, I didn't know very much about this, this network. Not very much has been written about it. Uh, but uh, fortunately, one of the people that I interviewed was someone that had um, a very close knowledge of the way the radio network worked and uh, uh, how things were programmed on it. And uh, they were able to tell me that uh, the third radio network is a very local level broadcasting system. Uh, will broadcast to just to a particular a town or an area of a province. Uh, and uh, they'll provide local news and information. Uh, this is one of the ways that uh, if there's a dignitary coming to town, the state will tell people that you need to keep this area of the town extra clean. You need to be on your best behavior in this area because someone's coming. Um, it's also, for example, when there are air raid drills, one of the ways that the state tells people there's going to be an air raid drill. Um, that type of announcement is never on state radio that we can hear overseas. Uh, but the other thing that they do is that they, uh, um, at least in the, the um, city where, where this um, interviewee worked, was they had a weekly program where they reported on crimes in the city. And uh, one of the staffers from the radio station would go to the police office. They would get a list of all of the people that were accused of committing crimes and all of the crimes that they had been accused of committing. And this would be read out on air. Uh, so this was another way that... Uh, you know, the state was trying to stop you doing any of this. You would hear the names of your neighbors and the areas where they were living and what they were caught for and what they were accused of doing. Uh, now, while I said that state TV doesn't directly address the problem of foreign content, I do think that in closely watching it, we have seen some reaction to foreign content in state television. 
Uh, in late 2017, uh, Korean Central Television began broadcasting in high definition. Uh, until then, the only high definition content in North Korea was smuggled in content on USB sticks. Now, if you remember when high def TV started, the first time you saw that picture, it was amazing. Now, imagine that you've got North Korean TV in standard definition, and you've got these high, def high definition stuff coming from overseas. Not only is the quality better and the picture looks better, but the production values are much higher. Everything looks more interesting. Uh, so state TV um, obviously has a problem attracting viewers these days. Uh, the other thing that it uh, recently started doing earlier this year was it started using infographics and computer graphics in news segments. Uh, now, this is something that has been going on for decades in other countries, but North Korea had never used even a simple graph or an infographic. Uh, they're now using them, and I think part of, of what this is is an attempt by the state to try to make state television a little bit more attractive to people, uh, to try to keep that audience by, by making it look more interesting. Uh, unfortunately, the problem with state TV is that, and, and in fact anything from the state, is that no matter how much you uh, sort of paint it up, the content is never going to change. The content is still all about the Workers' Party, all about the Kim family, and I think to, in, these, in this day and age, uh, that's, that's the real battle they need to change, but of course they're never going to do that. Um, one of the things I looked at, though, in this report um, on television was uh, how North Korean TV covers world news. Uh, so, you know, North Koreans do hear something about the rest of the world. Uh, it isn't a, a, a total a blockade. But, but what they hear comes through um, the newspapers and television. Uh, I, had, I had access to a, a year's worth of TV, and I looked at the 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. news broadcasts on Korean Central Television um, from June 1st last year to May 31st this year. Uh, 5 p.m., it was much more common to have foreign news than in the 8 p.m. bulletin, which is the main bulletin. Um, there were 388 reports on, on things going on around the world, uh, carried on 140 days. So, so less than half of the time, half of the days, foreign news was carried. Uh, when it was broadcast, it was always the last thing in the news bulletin. Um, if you've ever watched North Korean TV news, anything about the Kim family or, or Kim Jong-un always comes first. Then there's news about the Workers' Party. Then there's some um, economic, agricultural news. And then if there's foreign news, it comes right at the end. Um, by looking at a year's worth of this news, uh, one of the conclusions, one of the things we can see is that North Korean TV paints a, a picture of a world that is in constant chaos. Uh, in a moment, we're going to uh, play a video, uh, which is from December 11th, just a week ago. Um, it's, a, it, I think, two minutes long, uh, but it is the foreign news segment from the evening news. So if you were in North Korea watching TV, uh, this is what you would have seen. Uh, have a look at the video, and then also uh, the subtitles as well. You can see the spin that's put on what's going on in the world. Israel Guni. 6일 가자지대 동부의 경계 지역에서 팔레스타인들의 시위를 야수적으로 탄압했습니다. 이날 이스라엘군은 강점과 봉쇄를 반대해서 시위를 벌리는 수백 명의 팔레스타인에게 실탄과 고무탄 최루 가수를 마구 쏘았습니다. 그러해서 시위자들 속에서 37명의 부상자가 나왔습니다. 이에 앞서 5일 이스라엘군은 여르단강 소환 지역의 여러 도시에서 수배자들을 찾는다는 부당한 구실을 내걸고 15명의 팔레스타인을 체포했습니다. 헤브론시에서는 이스라엘군에 의해서 네 채의 살림집이 강제 철거되어 11명의 팔레스타인이 한지에 나앉았다고 합니다. 최근 해내외에 있는 미국의 군사 기지들에서 무장 공격 사건이 연이어 발생하고 있습니다. 6일 플로리다주에 있는 미 해군기지에서 총격 사건이 벌어져 3명이 죽고 8명이 부상당했습니다. 그곳에서 훈련을 받고 있던 사우디아라비아군의 한 조종사가 이날 기지에서 총을 가지고 들어가 란사했다고 합니다. 련방수사국이 테러 공격의 요부를 조사하며 복닥소동을 일으키고 있다고 합니다. 이 밖에도 수리아와 이라크에 있는 미군 기지들에서도 무장 공격을 받는 사건이 발생했다고 합니다. 인디아의 뉴델리에서 8일 새벽 화재가 일어나 43명이 목숨을 잃었습니다. 화재는 
시의 북부지역에 있는 4층짜리 공장에서 발생했습니다. 공장에서는 가방과 수지나 종이를 이용해서 포장용기를 만들었다고 합니다. 밝혀진 데 의하면 사망자들은 건물 안에서 일하다가 밤에 그곳에서 잠을 자던 상태였다고 합니다. 유럽 우주국 과학자들이 달 표면을 모방한 시험장을 꾸려놓고 지구와 멀리 떨어진 국제우주정류소에서 우주비행사가 원격으로 지구에 있는 달 표면 자동차를 조종하는 모의 시험을 진행했습니다. 이 모의 시험의 목적은 인간이 달에서 우주 정복에 필요한 기술을 연구하고 사람과 로봇 사이의 협조에서 중요한 기초를 쌓는 데 있다고 합니다. 아, uh, 아, Uh, in terms of the areas that were covered, though, um, after this, all this sort of coverage of South Korean politics, the next biggest area that they focused on was the weather. Uh, there were many, many stories about storms, floods, and droughts happening all over the world. Uh, there was some U.S. news. Uh, there was a, a U.S. news clip in there, and that was, that was very typical of the U.S. news that's covered. It was usually either... Um, Uh, shootings, crimes, uh, some of the mass demonstrations that we've seen in Washington in the last year. Um, I think the, uh, I can't remember, I think one of the, one of the Me Too marches in Washington, D.C. was covered on uh, North Korean television. Uh, but all of the stories that they're showing to their people, that is in, in one of the ways that they're countering all of this information coming in, um, all of the stories uh, show uh, people suffering around the world or people that are in conflict with their leaders. Uh, the only uh, sort of exception to that, which you saw at the end of this, was there is um, a regular sort of science feature, and they do, do you show little science clips, which is you know kind of non-political, um, and you saw the the European Space Agency research in there too. Um, in fact, after spending several days a couple of months ago looking at all of this North Korean TV news. Um, I did discover only one positive thing about it, which was that in my days and days of watching this, I hadn't had to see a single thing about Brexit. So, <laughs> almost a reason to move there, but not quite. Um, but that's, I mean, that is important. That's, that is a, sort of an example of a, a big issue like that, or the U.S. midterm elections got zero coverage on, on North Korean television. So they didn't hear about some of these issues that are dominating uh, global headlines. Um, and finally in the report, or the next area I looked at was uh, technology. And this is perhaps at the moment the most dynamic area Uh, of response from the North Korean state to what's coming in. Uh, for sure, some of the old methods are still in use. Uh, radio continues to be a very effective way to send information into North Korea. It's the only way to get same-day information into the country. Uh, and North Korea still continues to jam RFA, VOA, KBS, broadcasters like that. Uh, in a country where electricity is in such short supply, Uh, the amount of energy sucked up by their jamming operation uh, is really quite astounding, but I think it, it also underlines how serious a threat they see to these radio broadcasts coming in, that they're willing to use as much electricity just to stop people listening to them. Um, up along the northern border, the security forces have also stepped up their battle against people that are using Chinese mobile phones. Um, if you don't know a, you know, a few miles, kilometers into North Korea, you can still get a Chinese cellular signal, And that means that you can get directly onto the Chinese network, which gives you international calls in the internet. Um, we spend a lot of time you know, worrying about filtering of the Chinese internet. But of course, when you have no internet, the Chinese internet is, is you know, com almost completely free and, and wonderful to access. Um, but I think the greatest innovation, if that's the right word, in the last few years from the North Korean state has been how they're reacting to smartphones and PCs. Uh, inside North Korea, the state control of the network is absolute. Uh, they don't have to worry about a great firewall like China because there's just no internet, right? 
Um, so when PCs first started appearing, there was no security software on them because people couldn't access anything with them. But as uh, content moved from VHS to DVD and then onto USB, uh, PCs and cell phones started becoming more useful as a way to consume content, and the government realized that it had to, to do something about that. Um, so North Korean gadgets now come with several security apps built in. Uh, they run on Android, uh, which is an open source operating system, so it's easy for anyone to take and modify. Uh, and uh, North Korea has modified it in a way that severely restricts what people can do on their smartphones. Uh, it's not a stretch to say that North Korean smartphones are probably the most restrictive anywhere in the world. Uh, for a start, uh, one of the things is an app that runs on desktop PCs and phones that records every web page that you visit. Uh, now, you've got your history file in your browser, right? Well, this is a history file that can never be deleted. It stays there. Uh, there's a companion app to that that takes uh, screenshots on your phone at random times. So you never know. You know, If you pull up something listed on your phone, the phone might choose that moment to take a screenshot. That goes into a database as well, and you can't delete any of that. Now, what makes this, I think, particularly sinister is the sort of simplicity of the way that it works, because the North Korean state has also added an application that lets you look at those screenshots. So you can see what it's screenshot, you just can't delete it. So if you've been caught, you know that that's in your phone, you know that you can't delete that. It's a really, I think, if probably an effective way of letting people, uh, making people remember constantly that they're being watched when they're using their cell phone, even if they're on their own. Uh, and it doesn't stop there. Um, there's also a file watermarking system. Uh, now, this works uh, when you open a file, um, a, a text file, an image, a video file on your phone. Uh, it adds a, a little value to the end of the file. The value is based on the serial number of your phone. So that goes on to the end of the file. And then if I give the file to someone else, my serial number stays on the file and their serial number is added. Uh, the system like this means that if content is distributed, you can go back and you can look and you can start to gather evidence on everybody that has handled that content. Um, if on a mass scale, if you did this on a national level, you could in fact go all the way back and figure out where the distribution nodes are. Um, at the moment, we don't see much evidence that North Korea is sort of doing this on a mass scale, but this system is there so that they can trace that back. And um, certainly, while they might not be doing it routinely, I'm sure that in certain cases where they're targeting people, uh, this, is, this is one of the areas of evidence that they use. Uh, there's, there's another block on phones, uh, which are digital signatures. Uh, these weren't on North Korean cell phones at the beginning, but in 2012, the government enforced everybody to upgrade the Android on their phones. Uh, this is when, the, this is when the, the state really started getting serious about security. And uh, in fact, if you look on the, the cover of the report, uh, you'll see a little red star up in the corner. Um, depending on the model of the phone, it's either a red star or it's the little, uh, you know, the signal level uh, uh, in the corner of your phone. Um, it'll be in red. Um, originally, it was in blue on the phones. And when North Korea made everybody upgrade their Android operating system, they changed this to red. It was a really simple way that when people were stopped in the street and their phones were checked, uh, the security service could immediately see if the phone had been upgraded with the new security features. If it hadn't, uh, then they would force the upgrade on the spot. Um, so the digital signal signature system came around in 2012, and uh, that means that the phones now will pretty much only play files that either have a, a government signature or a personal signature. So that means that if you take a photo with your phone or you record a video with your phone, your personal signature is added to it, it'll play on your phone. The only other stuff it will play is something that comes from the state intranet, something comes from the government with that government signature. Uh, if someone else takes a video and gives it to you, your phone's not going to play it. So that severely restricts the use of telephones for anything other, th other than official or personal content. Uh, but it even restricts it to the level that you know, family members would have difficulty, um, say, uh, you know, a picture of a, uh, your child or something. Uh, you know, Mum wouldn't be able to share that with dad or something like that because of the security on the telephones. Um, and finally, uh, there's uh, the, the final bit of software in there is a, a check that when the phone or the PC is powered on, it looks at all of the central security and operating system files in the phone to see if they've been changed. And if they've been changed, it just reboots the phone. 
Uh, that means that if you change anything on the phone, if you try to get around these security systems, the phone will just continually restart uh, and, and your phone is useless. Um, so, I mean, that's why it's a sort of weird way of saying it, but that's why we, we sort of, you know, one of the words, this is, is fairly innovative if you're a totalitarian regime because you've, the North Koreans really have so far done a very good job of trying to lock down, lock down these from their point of view. Uh, and they're making it very difficult. Um, I work with a couple of uh, security engineers in Germany, um, a lot of whose work is included in this. And uh, we had a discussion about, well, you know, if we wanted to lock these down anymore, if we, if we were in Kim Jong-un's shoes, what would we do? And we couldn't really think of much else we could do. They really have done a very good job so far. So um, uh, they certainly know that this is a big battle that they need to win, and, and they're putting everything into it. Um, just a, a couple more things before I finish here. Um, Wi-Fi is quite interesting. On the early devices, Wi-Fi didn't exist uh, because there was no internet. But in 2013, uh, an embassy in Pyongyang set up an open Wi-Fi hotspot with access to the internet. And um, pretty quickly, the North Korean authorities went completely nuts. And they sent all the embassies a letter saying that they weren't allowed to operate any Wi-Fi until it had been checked and approved, which meant basically you know, that it had security on it. Um, so the state is very, very worried about this kind of thing. Um, Wi-Fi is now available in North Korea. Um, on the reports cover, the, uh, on the top row, the second from the right, the logo there is. This is a, a real North Korean cell phone screenshot, by the way. Um, we changed the app names to English. And the global news down the bottom is, of course, one we made up. But everything else on there, these are real apps. This is a real screenshot from a phone. Um, the Mirai Wi-Fi network is now operating in Pyongyang. But uh, from everything we, we hear, it works on a SIM card, which is never used for Wi-Fi. Um, so I think also speaks to some of the state's nervousness about authentication on the network and controlling the technology. Uh, and the very final uh, thing I wanted to talk about was um, what might be some efforts at social engineering that's going on as well, uh, which also represents a <coughs> challenge to foreign content going in. Um, the phone that I took the screenshot off, the Dayang 8321, um, there's a catalog on there of more than 125 smartphone games. Uh, now, a, a few of them are, you know, ideological games, like, you know, let's, you know, protect Korea from the aggressors or uh, some, you know, stupid thing like that. But um, most of them are simple games, you know, um, Tetris and things like that, right? Absolutely zero ideology, ideology in them at all. One of the things we've seen around the world is that when more people play cell phone games, they have less time for other media. <laughs> TV viewing is going down. People don't read newspapers anymore because they're on their phones. Um, I might be giving the North Korean state too much credit here, but one of the reasons they might be um, encouraging the development of smartphone games is because it ties up people's time. Everything else on these phones is ideological in some way or has some use for people's lives. Um, uh, school textbooks, uh, cooking recipes, but these games are simply there to kill time. Uh, and the other thing that's been happening is that North Korea started rolling out an IPTV system that runs on the national intranet, and it has a, a set-top box. Uh, I got a picture of one in the report. Um, and with that, areas outside the country have access to more than just central television. They get the other three TV channels from Pyongyang, and they have a week or two's worth of content on demand. And again, I wonder if this is one of the re I wonder if one of the reasons behind this is because North Korea is trying to keep people within the state TV um, ecosystem. I'm sure a lot of stuff on state TV is boring, but some of the stuff on state TV isn't. They have like uh, you know Premier League soccer on there. So if you're a soccer fan and there's a match on in the evening and you've got an hour to spend, maybe you're going to watch that rather than switch on TV and say, oh, it's another documentary about the Kims, let's watch that South Korean drama. Um, so I think one of the ways that the government is also responding is trying to put more of its own entertainment out there to people to give them more options. Some people, of course, will always watch foreign content. Some people will never because they don't believe in it. And there's probably this sort of ground in the center of people that will watch it but some of them don't real, kind of feel right about it because it's breaking the law and they're not sure what to do. And there's, there's you know, some people I think they might be able to persuade with a broader um, range of their own content. So um, that's, uh, well, you, you don't need to read the report now. You know, uh, now you know everything that's in it. Um, 
Uh, no, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot more in there, and um, if you do read it and you have questions, I encourage you to contact me. Um, we started off talking about what was going on in Romania 30 years ago, and uh, someone earlier asked me how I got interested in North Korea, and uh, it was, you know, as I was growing up in Europe and in the Cold War, and I used to listen to um, RFE and uh, VOA, and you could listen to, to Radio Moscow and, and Radio Bucharest, and all of these different voices sending different news, and, and it was fascinating to me, and, and that's how I got interested in this whole area. Um, but it's also uh, a little bit sad and disappointing that 30 years later, shortwave radio is still the best we can do with North Korea, um, especially for, for daily information. And it really shows, I think, the challenge that, that 30 years on, this is still what we're dealing with here. Not that it's a, a bad way of doing it, but it's, it's, you know, it's a big challenge. Um, I think the North Korean state undoubtedly knows it, ha it has a big fight on when it comes to foreign content, uh, but it's fighting back hard especially in the technological realm. Um, it's, it's been quite resourceful in the way that it blocks content and tries to control what people do with their smartphones. Uh, with each new technology or innovation, uh, that gives us a, a new chance to provide North Koreans with greater access to information. Um, but continuing development and innovation on our parts, I think, will be essential uh, to stay one step ahead of the North Korean state. Thank you, Mark. Terrific. And Martin, of course, addressing that particular challenge is a great way to begin our panel discussion. Our first uh, panelist today is uh, our HRNK board member, David Maxwell, currently senior fellow with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Army, retired as a U.S. Special Forces colonel, command and staff assignments in Korea, the Philippines, Germany, the United States. Um, Colonel Maxwell is a member of multiple um, academic associations and organizations dealing with Korean Peninsula issues, International Council on Korean Studies, um, the Institute of Korean American Studies, and uh, Dave, you and FDD have recently published, just about a week ago, eight, six days ago, uh, a report, an FDD report on uh, maximum pressure 2.0, human rights and information. These two particular issues are addressed in great detail. Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. And uh, congratulations, Martin, on a, on a great report. You, you know, he said uh, you don't need to report, read the report after his great summary, which was a great summary. Uh, you actually do need to read it. And uh, I hope his remarks really just, uh, uh, you know, was a, a big tease for you because uh, I, I really recommend this. Which brings me to the, the two points I really want to make. When you're a discussant, following a great keynote speech by the ambassador, following great remarks. You know, people don't tend to listen to discussions. So I just want to make two points that if you, uh, you remember anything I say, uh, these two points. Number one is, I strongly recommend this report. Without a doubt, without reservation, read this report. It is important. And the second is, if you have any interest in North Korea, and if you work in the information space, uh, that I urge you to read this, to study it, to internalize it, to use it, exploit it, uh, because this is really, really important. And, uh, and so please remember those two points. You must read this, you must use this. Um, let me start off with a, uh, a statement that came from an escapee uh, who, was recently wrote a, who recently wrote a letter to President Trump with advice on how he should deal with uh, Kim Jong-un. And uh, from his letter to President Trump, he said, the most effective way to resolve the North Korean issue is to conduct psychological warfare operations. It can have the same power as a nuclear bomb. It is also an ideal way to get the North Koreans to solve their own problems by themselves. Now, that may seem over the top, uh, you know, with rhetoric as information as powerful as a nuclear bomb, uh, but I think we should consider that. Uh, in, you know, not that we want to drop a nuclear bomb, and we certainly hope that North Korea doesn't do that, but information is really key, and information is key to change. In Special Forces, we have a motto to free the oppressed, de oppresso liber, uh, which really uh, we like to translate as to help the oppressed free themselves. And, uh, and as Martin has outlined, uh, getting information to the people of North Korea, to the Koreans living in the North, is 
a way to help them help themselves. Uh, and so this report really gets, gets at that. Um, I didn't quite get to see the video from our perch here, but uh, listening to it, uh, you know, the one thing that was missing on it uh, uh, that uh, I think are commercials. I don't, yeah. I don't think you see any commercials. But you talk about the production values and, and the standards there, and I see friends from VOA and, and RFA here in the audience, uh, and you know, I look at what they produce compared to what the North produces, it's so far superior. And, uh, and if our friends from VOA and, and RFA produce something at, at that level there, I think they'd be out of jobs uh, because uh, I, I don't think that their, their bosses would stand for something uh, of that quality. Uh, so VOA and RFA are, are critical, as well as uh, the work that Suzanne Schulte and, and uh, with escapees does with uh, getting information into, into North Korea. Uh, the efforts of private organizations are just uh, are, are really critically important uh, to this effort. What I like about this report, though, and the report itself to me serves as an example, because when you read reports like this, some people are just focused on the technical, some people on the information, the ideological, uh, the legal aspects, which I think is an interesting aspect of this, uh, really understanding how North Korea uh, uses its laws, you know, its rule of law, uh, you know, to, to uh, protect itself against uh, outside information. Uh, but the report itself serves as an example that you have to take a holistic approach to this. Uh, and you can't just be uh, knowledgeable in one area. Uh, and particularly with information, it underpins every other aspect, uh, every other instrument of national power, diplomacy, military, uh, and the economy. Uh, and, and so it's really, really important to, uh, um, to focus on information and to take a holistic approach. We in the United States, you know, frankly speaking, are afraid of information. We're afraid of information and influence activities. Uh, Greg mentioned our report that uh, came out. I really wish that I had access to this report months ago when we were writing our report, as I certainly would have cited it. And I would, and and I will forever now. When I, uh, whenever I talk about our report, I will be uh, uh, adding Martin's report to uh, to what we've done because it really operationalizes in great detail uh, many of the things that we recommend. Uh, and so it really, I'm, I'm now going to call it a companion report and, uh, and tout it that way. But you're right from the beginning, the, uh, what, what's also really important about this report, uh, right in Greg's introduction there, you know, talking about the three basic stories that all Koreans in the North really need to know. Uh, one is the corruption of their leadership, you know, especially the Kim family regime. Uh, next, of course, as we've talked about, information about the outside world, especially the free and democratic and prosperous South Korea. Uh, and then, of course, the third is the story of their own human rights. You know, the, the, the Korean people in the North uh, have their human rights denied uh, in order to keep uh, the Kim family regime in power. Now, I'm often reminded, I often quote Dr. Jung Pak from, from Brookings, who's sat here on this stage in previous reports that we've done, and she asked right here, who does Kim Jong-un fear most, the United States or the Korean people living in the North? And, you know, I would answer, uh, when you look at Sung Boon, you look at Everything that's done, you look at everything that Martin's uh, described so far today, uh, is they're afraid of the Korean people living in the North, more afraid of them than the United States. Uh, and I, I would add that uh, they're afraid of Koreans living in the North armed with information, and especially knowledge about the South. You know, the South is an exemplar that, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, of which Kim is very afraid. Uh, and so I, I recall uh, an escapee here about a year ago and she was talking about freedom. And I think this is what we in, in the West and we as non-Koreans non from the North, you know, have such a difficult time. Everyone in this room understands freedom, is free. Uh, and, but we can't comprehend uh, what it is to not know freedom. And this young escapee, she said that uh, she thought she was free in North Korea. And she followed the Juche ideology. She did everything she was told. Uh, but when her family escaped, uh, she got to Seoul and she realized that she had no idea what freedom was. And she saw the people in Seoul and she realized this is freedom. People can dress the way they want, do what they want, eat what they want, uh, when they want. And, uh, and they, they have you know, the basic right of freedom. Of course, she also told, told us that she was still very afraid she was in Seoul because she was looking for American soldiers. 
because she had been taught that American soldiers occupy South, uh, South Korea and Seoul, and American soldiers will abuse uh, uh, Korean women. And so she was deathly afraid to run into an American soldier, and it took some time uh, for her to learn that you know, American soldiers did not occupy Seoul. Uh, but I think that really illustrates the kind of indoctrination, the kind of, uh, of lack of, of understanding of freedom. Uh, and this is why information from the outside world is so important. Uh, Kim Guangjin describes it as a psychological paralysis. You know, the combination of indoctrination and the truth about the outside world, it really uh, uh, paralyzes people psychologically in, in the North. And I think that, that that is really important. The other point I want to make, uh, this may seem uh, kind of odd, but in uh, September of 2019, when President Moon traveled to Pyongyang, uh, Kim Jong-un made a strategic mistake. He allowed President Moon to make a speech to the people in the North. And I think, uh, I think he made a mistake, and he realized his mistake, because ever since then, he has really attacked South Korea and the Moon administration. Uh, but what the people saw in, in North Korea was, when President Moon spoke was a genuine man, a man that contradicted all the North Korean prop, uh, propaganda, somebody that they said, well, we can work with this guy, and that they expected Kim Jong-un to be able to make a deal to have sanctions lifted. And, uh, you know, and because he has, had, he has failed to have sanctions lifted, uh, and because... President Moon gained a lot of legitimacy in Pyongyang talking to the Korean people in the north. Uh, Kim Jong-un has had to recover from that. And I think you see the rhetoric uh, directed against him as, uh, as an example of that. And the reason I, I bring that up in relation to this is because information from the outside world, proof, the truth, has an impact. But more importantly, Kim Jong-un is afraid of that. And, uh, and he realized that mistake, and he realized that, uh, that the people uh, saw the truth in their own eyes and their own ears uh, when they heard the South Korean president speak. Uh, so I, I think that that is, that is really, really important. The last thing I want to I just end on this point uh, is this is an ideological war, uh, really between North and South. You know, we worry about uh, the 1.2 million man army. We worry about nuclear weapons and ICBMs but it's really an ideological war. And it's really a choice for all Koreans, North and South, and to make a choice about the values that they want to live. You have the South Korean and US shared values of freedom and individual liberty, liberal democracy, free market economy, and human rights for all people. Those are the values South Koreans and the United States and Americans share. And then you have the North Korean values, you know, which is, of course, Kim Il-sungism and the socialist workers' paradise, Juche, Songbun, Songun, and the denial of human rights to keep Kim Jong-un in power. And so that's really the choice. And this report really will allow people uh, to formulate plans and strategies to get information into the North so that the Korean people living in the North do have a choice. Which ideology, ideology do they want to follow? Which values do they want to follow? And I urge everyone to read the report and then to help in its implementation. Uh, we just have not, the last thing I wanna make a point uh, is we are afraid of information, as I said. And uh, some psychological operations professionals in the military told me once that it's easier to get permission to put a Hellfire missile on the forehead of a terrorist than it is to get permission to put an idea between someone's ears. And we need to reverse that. We need to make it easier to get information, to get ideas between the ears of Koreans in the North and focus less on the kinetic and more on the information and the truth. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tom Barker, who is uh, also a member of HRNK's Board of Directors. Uh, Tom is a partner and co-chair specialized in healthcare practice with a major law firm. And for many years, he has worked pro bono for North Korean escapees. He has helped many of them acquire asylum, permanent residence, citizenship. And I think, Tom, you have helped a total of 40 former North Koreans uh, acquire 
U.S. citizenship. He's intimately familiar not only with the SKP community, but also with uh, the groups and individuals that, for example, Suzanne works for, our friends in South Korea, Kim Song Min and the others. Um, Tom, together with the other board members, has also been very enthusiastic about Martin's report, and uh, we're very happy that you have joined the panel, Tom. Thank you, Greg. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, as Greg said, I have a, a, a pro bono practice at my law firm, and I have helped 40, as of last week, 40 North Korean defectors acquire U.S. citizenship. And uh, in that process, uh, I, as I was reading Martin's report, I, it, it really uh, struck home to me in, in many respects because many of the things that Martin discovered in his report really echoed things that I had heard from the defectors who I've helped. And so I just, I, I had a couple of points <laughs> that I, I wanted to make based on my experiences working with them. I too enjoyed the report very, very much. And uh, I guess I'll start off by making a couple of observations. Uh, so the first is, of all of the defectors who I have helped with their US immigration needs, uh, I would say that the vast majority are either from North Hamgyong province or Rangyang province in North Korea. So they are not members of the elite, not members of the Kim regime. The, the vast majority of the defectors I've helped are, are just common North Korean citizens, commoners, farmers, peasants, people who escaped in large part, not so much because of political ideology, but because of the famine, the lack of resources, the lack of any opportunity in North Korea, and, and just an, an, a, a quest or a desire for, for human freedom. Most of the defectors who I've helped did in fact have access to outside media sources, either because they purchased a radio illegally and uh, hid it in their house, uh, listened to it surreptitiously. Uh, also, I have helped defectors who were able to access South Korean videos, uh, drama, music, K-pop, and I also know one North Korean defector who was a Christian inside of North Korea, and so he was able to access the Bible and learn more about Christianity from covert sources. And of course, uh, being a Christian in North Korea is a, is a major, major crime and offense against the state that could probably get you sent, if you were lucky, just sent to a political prison camp and possibly even executed. And, and so th th having access to Christian-themed information, a South Korean radio station, a South Korean drama, all of those things are grave threats to the, to the Kim regime. One thing that I thought was really interesting in Martin's report is that, uh, and correct me if I'm, I'm overstating what you said in your report, but it's, it, it, as I read it, it seemed as though recently many offenses having information from outside of the outside of North Korea having a South Korean video for example can sometimes be dealt with just by a bribe to a ministry of state ministry for state security official or a ministry of people security official and may not lead to imprisonment and it seemed I, I read from your report that that really there are grades of offenses and that maybe just having a South Korean soap opera on your phone might not get you sent to a prison camp I think, though, as I read your report, that has changed over the years, and maybe four or five years ago, it was a much more severe offense, and that's certainly an experience that I have had from talking to North Korean defectors. Uh, most defectors had been able to listen to Radio Free Asia, VOA, or Free North Korean Radio. Free North Korea Radio. Uh, Greg mentioned Kim Song Min, who is the is the leader of Free North Korea Radio in Seoul. And most defectors who I know were able to listen to at least one of those sources. And from listening to those sources, really became aware that the information that they had been told about the outside world was a lie, and that what they had learned from their education was not accurate. So for example, the US government and US military have not invaded Seoul, and there are not US soldiers in actively roaming the streets or patrolling the streets of Seoul. One thing that strikes me is the number of North Korean defectors, at least 
North Korean defectors that I know who had some exposure to Christianity from listening to outside sources of information. Uh, the handful of defectors who I have helped who were members of the elite and lived in Pyongyang had less information about Christianity than those who lived in the outer provinces. And I, I attribute that probably to the fact that it, the closer that you get to the heart of the Kim regime, the harder it is to get access to information that is truly a threat to the state. And, and uh, I offer that information for what it's worth. Um, I'll conclude with the story of one defector who I know who was alive and living in North Korea in 1994, in the summer of 1994, when Kim Il-sung died. He was, uh, he was a participant in one of the, the funeral processions in Pyongyang during the, uh, after the death of, of Kim Il-sung and really began to question the, the histrionics that went on during Kim Il-sung's funeral, people throwing themselves on the street, weeping, crying. Uh, he, he really questioned, he, he started to question the underlying basis for the regime based on that experience. And he shortly thereafter that uh, illegally acquired a transistor radio. And so he would listen to it at night, keeping the radio under his pillow, wearing headphones. And he started to listen to Radio Free Asia and Voice of America and, and started to hear reports from the outside world. And he told me that that experience and the surreal experience of Kim Il-sung's funeral really convinced him and made him begin to question what he was being told about the government. And that gave that experience, that knowledge, gave him the desire to escape and to get out of North Korea. And really, I'll wrap up by saying, that really is the message of, of Martin's report to me, which is that what the Kim regime fears most is their citizens getting access to information about the outside world. Because getting access to information about the outside world it plants in the heart of a North Korean the desire to be free, the understanding, even if they can't articulate it, the understanding that they are not really free, and it gives them a desire to escape North Korea. And, and that's certainly what happened to my friend who I'm talking about. It, it was the combination of the, the, the farce of the Kim Il-sung funeral plus the access to information that he got by listening to, to RFA and DOA, and that that really planted in his heart the seed to, to escape from North Korea and get out. And um, so I will end with, I will end my remarks there. Our next speaker is Michael Anderson, who's a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, retired as a major. He served in various leadership and intelligence positions. Following his retirement, he has held positions including career desk officer with the Special Operations Command Pacific and uh, also senior North Korea geopolitical analyst with PACOM Joint Intelligence Operations Center in Hawaii. Uh, he is a true expert in information, information operations, during the Cold War period, post-Cold War period, and I think it's, again, very timely today to have senior experts who also bring memories and, and experience in that part of the world. Uh, memories of information campaigns that were successful, so after all here, we're here to talk about the past, present, and also future of information operations in North Korea. Mike, the floor is yours. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks to uh, HRNK for uh, the invitation to be up here, certainly with a distinguished panel. Martin, thanks for the report. Um, it certainly is an addition and a great addition to a lot of what's going on now and, and as I'll talk about um, some of the things we need to know as we go forward. And thank you all for, for being here today. As many have mentioned during you know, post-World War II, it was a, another ideological competition or cold war between the Soviets and the United States where they were vying for influence and creating alliances using various levers, trade, security, defense. And they pushed other nations to make that ideological choice through various methods, mediums, and messages. Washington and Moscow tried to get nations to make the choice between communism and democracy. But after the Cold War ended, the United States created an organization, the U.S. Information Agency, 
whose sole focus was to counter Russian propaganda or information operations worldwide. It was informed by National Security Paper 68, or NSC, NSC 68, as it's referred to. It was informed by jo uh, George Kennan's containment strategy to espouse the virtues of democracy, tell the American story. Uh, and the US Information Agency, in order to do that, took into account the needs of the overseas audience when crafting the influence messaging selected mediums based on the ability to reach the audience effectively. Now, while there are many different uh, ways to send a message today, social media, texting, uh, email, the communications landscape in 1953 was very different. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, primarily messages and information came through two main sources, print or newspapers, and as Ambassador King mentioned, the radio. It's hard to imagine without the benefit of the advanced technology of today, how an influence campaign at the national or global scale, how, how would it be conducted and whether it would be effective or not. Similar to North Korea today, the Soviet, using, Soviet Union during the Cold War used, uh, employed a lot of tools of harsh censorship, political prisons, uh, secret police, extensive use of propaganda aimed at the Soviet population and disinformation to try to uh, cloud the message. There were also obstacles that the U.S. encountered in distribution and certainly language challenges. The major difference that, that I see between the Soviet Union of yesterday and the North Korea of today, outside of the technological advances uh, and the increased mediums available today, is that the success of the U.S. efforts during the Cold War relied on a number of vulnerabilities that are not necessarily present in the North Korean case, such as uh, the long religious history of the Soviet republics, which made them hungry for religious information or worship, a distinct ethnic identities, and a very active and vocal exile community, which with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, the use of emigres and exiles to actually broadcast various messages. However, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, U.S. expertise in political influence, counter-propaganda atrophied, and its associated support infrastructure reduced and absorbed by other agencies. USIA was done away with. A lot of the expertise was absorbed by the State Department. And many of the hard-won lessons learned in political influence, political warfare, and counter-propaganda have been forgotten. Uh, as Winston Churchill said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But I would also add that each closed society, as we viewed the Soviet Union as a closed society, certainly North Korea as a closed society, is different in its own way, including and especially North Korea. Uh, it's imperative to understand its specific culture, values, historical experience and memory, uh, national touchstones, et cetera, to effectively develop the themes, craft messages, and select mediums focused on an appropriate target audience to eventually, over time, and as Greg mentioned in his forward and certainly was, was echoed by several, this type of influence campaign, certainly during the Cold War and others, it takes a long time to develop and take root. Uh, and maybe over that long time we can achieve our desired outcomes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We are now going to open it up to the audience. If possible, please state your name and affiliation. Contessa, I'll go to you first and then to Peter. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon. I'd like to ask Martin and Tom, how can North Koreans access broadcasting from South Korea? And uh, how is uh, Voice of America progressing in its uh, spread of information for North Koreans? Um, from South Korea, uh, so the, ma the main way would be uh, radio. Um, uh, you know, radio, you have a shortwave, um, which is used by the international broadcasters, including KBS. Uh, but then uh, from South Korea itself, uh, all of the South Korean um, AM radio stations, in the nighttime, the signal will, uh, AM radio signals go further in the nighttime. So in the nighttime, it's, it's easier for them to cover, um, cover North Korea. 
Uh, some of the escapees I talked to also talked about listening to uh, Japanese radio, um, especially uh, the fishermen, because they wanted the weather forecast. And um, I don't know much about South Korean radio or its weather forecast, but apparently the Japanese weather forecast for the, for the um, East Sea was, was the one they all listened to. Um, so it's mainly AM radio. Um, television does come in, but it's, it's more difficult to receive because the TV signals are uh, quite often attenuated by all of the mountains so that the signal doesn't reach as far into the country. Um, and you need a sort of antenna outside to receive it, whereas AM, you know, you can get a little AM radio and at nighttime tune in quite easily. Um, the North Koreans actively jam shortwave. Uh, there is less jamming of AM. I believe the reason is probably because if they do that, they disrupt domestic reception in South Korea, of South Korean stations, and, and there will be a lot of complaints and, and problems with that. Um, but that's the way they're doing it at the moment. Does that answer your question? And perhaps we can direct the, the second question to the, those discussants who might be willing and ready to comment on this. Rather than focusing only on Voice of America, our VOA colleagues are in the, in the audience, we don't want to put them on the spot. Um, I would like to invite you to comment on the overall effectiveness of public broadcasting to North Korea. This involving, of course, VOA, RFA, the stations based in South Korea. So, uh, Dave? Yes, I think, uh, you know, as, as Martin has said, they, they of course jam, uh, but some does get through. And I think uh, I've heard from escapees uh, in Pyongyang, particularly Voice of America, um, the, uh, it is recorded and then they'll write transcripts of, of the recordings uh, to pass around to the elite. Of course, some of them are edited, uh, but I think that, that's, uh, that that is important. And I think, but we should never be discouraged when we hear that uh, there is jamming, uh, because you know that's the number one indicator that North Korea is afraid of information, and so we've got to press through multiple uh, uh, methods. And you know we know that the DVDs and thumb drives are important. Uh, you know Martin talks about uh, this Wi-Fi network. I'm sure that we're going to be able to uh, uh, to be able to access that. You know commercial companies. You know I'd love to see a. Uh, geosynchronous satellite uh, over North Korea that would uh, penetrate the Wi-Fi system, you know, and we could directly access it. And uh, Martin and I were talking before, maybe uh, Elon Musk and, and, uh, and some of these uh, companies can, uh, you know, can produce something like that. Uh, but I think that we should not be discouraged when we hear about jamming. It means we need to work harder because information is a threat uh, to Kim Jong-un and it is good for the people in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, jam, jamming is, um, it, it is a problem. Um, the easiest way to overcome jamming is to just put more transmitters on the air yeah. because they've only got so many jamming transmitters. If they've got X number of jamming transmitters, if you put X plus one on the air, then someone can, can find a clear signal. And, and jamming is also highly dependent on, on the weather and the day, um, where you live. Uh, so it's definitely, it definitely shows that, that North Korea wants to stop that information coming in. There's, there's, as, as I said, the amount of electricity they use to stop this in a country that has no electricity. Think about that. Mike, any thoughts on this? I would just key in on something that, that David said in that it's, it's a multi-pronged approach. So, you know, radio was one aspect, but I think, you know, the, when we're looking at an influence campaign overall, you need to go after everything. And I think the beautiful thing about today that was not available back in, say, 1953 or whatever, and if you look over the, the history, the 40 or 50 year history, things were added, right? The, the Olympics got added as an event and, you know, movies and, you know, a, a relationship with Hollywood and then, you know, some of the, the literature and whatnot. We can, you know, Dr. Zhivago and, and that sort of thing. I think in this, in what's exciting about this time, and I think what is, what is awesome about uh, Martin's report is that we can see vulnerabilities. We can use technology. We can see all of these mediums and, and you know, uh, the uh, social media aspect, but we can't forget about literature. We can't forget about radio. We can't forget about, I mean, there's books that have been written that, you know, uh, North Koreans talk in their own kind of coded language like we all do. Uh, you know you know what you're talking about, but nobody else knows what you're talking about kind of thing. Graphic novels. Um, and I think we exploit them all. And if we, we get um, 
you know, jamming messes us up in one area, that doesn't mean that that puts us off in, in various publications or other things. So I think that's an absolute uh, great point is that I think we have to explore them all. Terrific. Tom, uh, we have, of course, all read a quiet opening, uh, Nat Gretchen's uh, report. Um, but based on, on the evidence you collected uh, from those escapees you have worked with, did they mention preference? Did they mention that they listened to one particular radio station more than others? I, I would say RFA right. was, is the number one. Well, I see some of our RFA colleagues in the audience here, so <laughs> there you go. Peter Humphrey, and then we'll go to you, sir. And then to Mark Manning. Just following up on David's comment, you can't run a Wi-Fi from a 23,000-mile geosynchronous satellite, but you can from uh, stratospheric drones, XP-47s, uh, <clears throat> Things like uh, sat low satellite networks, uh, small sats that are trading a signal amongst themselves. Um, and so I want to know, why haven't we made investments in this technology? Yeah, sure, it's expensive. But compared to the price of a war, this is peanuts. And it is literally the way to win. It's the death of a thousand cuts mul multiplied by a hundred times more. So why haven't we gone there? Uh, the answer is really in what Michael was talking about. We go back to Kenan, political warfare. We are not conducting a superior po form of political warfare against North Korea. We are focused on kinetic warfare. We, you know, but really, it is ideology, ideology and idea-based warfare. And, uh, and I think that, uh, and as I said, we're afraid of ideas. We're afraid of information. Uh, but I agree that it is a key uh, instrument of power that we should be investing in, uh, in multiple ways. On the second row. Uh, Mitsuo Nakai is my name, uh, Reagan Foundation. Uh, my question is, it, uh, what's next, Dave? I mean, it, long range missile testing again uh, coming up in 2020? Or, uh, so if that's the case, what's our best move? Aside from human uh, rights uh, violation, thank you. I think that's a whole different topic from this one here, so I, I really don't want to distract from that. You know, he could test, and he may not test. You know, he may be giving us a look, so uh, I, I think that's for a different discussion. I think we should focus on information. Mark Manning, then we'll go to you, sir, and then to Stanley. Hi, Mark Mannion with the Congressional Research Service. Thanks for a great report. What well, looks like a great report and a great uh, session this morning. Um, Martin, can you talk uh, at all about uh, whether the North Koreans are importing any technology or techniques, I'm talking about the, the government now, uh, the surveillance state uh, from China uh, to upgrade their capabilities? Um, and then a question for anyone on the panel is, um, can you talk about what the South Korean government is and is not doing to uh, to help or at least to, or, or to encourage or discourage uh, sort of this information uh, campaign? Uh, that's uh, actually something that uh, Greg and I were talking about yesterday. Um, you know, what's going on in China now uh, versus North Korea. Um, it looks like at the moment, uh, North Korea is doing a lot of development of its own security systems, uh, but it, the, the, it doesn't, it doesn't appear like they're putting um, together anything close to what the Chinese are doing at the moment. Having said that, in the North Korean context, it makes perfect sense that this is something that they would be looking at. Uh, you know, North Korea relies on this, this huge, uh, you know, literal army of people that keeps watch. Um, and as people uh, begin using digital devices more, uh, more and more of their lives and their movements are exposed to those devices. Uh, so it would make sense that they're starting to look at that kind of stuff. Um, it does require a lot of technology and coordination, which I don't think they necessarily have at the moment. Um, recently, uh, a couple of months ago, I, I wrote something, we put it up on 38 North, about the beginnings of the cell phone network. And this was 10, 10 years ago. Um, even then, though, um, one of the, the documents we had um, were the requirements from the government for the uh, legal intercept gateway. 
Uh, and even back then, the government was spelling out, we need to be able to listen to this many phone calls at a time. We need to be able to look at these text messages. And we want to look at web traffic and FTP traffic. And they were spelling out all of the different things that they wanted access to. So they're, they're definitely thinking about it. Um, it isn't something that I've seen a lot of people talk about as something that's going on, but I'd be really surprised if it wasn't coming really soon. I would, I would uh, add um, China's 5G network uh, in, uh, in China, just north of, uh, of uh, North Korea. I've read some reports that uh, it, with its inherent surveillance capabilities, it's had an impact on smuggling, cross-border smuggling. And, and that, that's having an effect. And I think it's probably only a matter of time, perhaps, that China maybe exports some of that technology to North Korea uh, you know, as one of the world's greatest surveillance states, maybe to do some R&D and developing, because I think between you know, the North Korean system and Chinese technology, they could really create uh, you know, a, a massive surveillance state. And to your other question on South Korea, uh, and I think we have seen in this administration that they are not in favor of information going into the north, and they have not supported the escapee organizations uh, and have you know, actually, in some cases, hindered their operations. And I think that's an example uh, of uh, misguided understanding of North Korea and of, uh, uh, of policies. Uh, to think that uh, not sending information into North Korea is somehow going to have a positive policy outcome uh, you know, and engender some kind of reciprocal response or goodwill from the North, I think it's mistaken. And I hearken back to Ronald Reagan uh, when he was conducting arms control with the Soviet Union and his advisors uh, did not want him to talk about human rights in the Soviet Union. And he discounted their advice and made human rights as part of the agenda. And of course, we see what happened. We should never be afraid to have human rights on the agenda, and we should never be afraid uh, to engage the information instrument of power, uh, because failing to do so is not going to bring a good outcome. I, I, I agree with David on that point. I, I, um, I, you can see that the Moon administration does not want information to get inside of North Korea, and it's not only from the radio broadcast, it's also even just like the, the um, the, the balloon launches with pamphlets and leaflets going into North Korea that, that the Moon administration has, has clearly blocked from taking place. Mike? I would just in general say that if you look back, and I, I would again agree with David in the fact that there's any one element of, of national power is not gonna be a silver bullet. It has to be a symbiotic effort between all of them. Now, it may be we're using a big D and a medium-sized I and a medium-sized M for you know, information military and our economic efforts, but they all have to be tied together. Even when Eisenhower started USIA, he mentioned that information as an element of national power informs and is infused into the other three. It has to be used. And again, I mean, the United States did everything. We did things militarily. We did things diplomatically. But... We went, I mean, the United States was prevalent in trade shows. We were in the Olympics. There were, there were other things and venues where we were just telling the American story. We were just showing that democracy was better. We weren't beating them over the head. We could just show it. And I think until it's a coordinated effort like that, so that like reports that we see that tell us where the vulnerabilities are and we have all of the elements in sync with each other, that we can exploit those vulnerabilities. I think that's where we get the momentum that we need. Terrific. Um, we will take just two more questions. It was you, sir, and then Stanley Kober. Maybe you can spend a few more minutes after the event. Talk to the panelists, please go ahead. I'm Mehdi Yanjat from Net Freedom Pioneers. My question is for Martin. Um, I was wondering if people can own, unlock the Android phones and hide it at their homes. And also, um, I was wondering how frequent the raids are. Is it something that uh, happens once in a lifetime, or does it happen more, uh, more often? Uh, so the unlocked Android phones aren't something that's officially available, so it's something that will be smuggled in. Um, it, it's definitely that someone could own, and, and some North Koreans do own them. Um, they're really, once you get beyond the uh, you know, Chinese border, beyond the reception range of Chinese cellular signals, um, an unlocked Android phone essentially becomes just a media player. And uh, over the last few years, a lot of 
very much cheaper Chinese media players have gone in. So I think probably unless you're using it for communications, people would prefer to just get a media player. Um, Certainly an unlocked Android phone uh, would probably have difficulties getting onto the national network, so you wouldn't be able to use it as a domestic handset anyway. Um, the raids and things like that, no, it's, it's um, uh, I don't have any figures on how often, but it's, it's definitely more than once in a lifetime. Um, it depends on who you are and where you are, um, the time of the day, what, what, you know, what's going on politically. Also, some of the crackdowns that happen nationwide will depend on what's going on in terms of uh, different national holidays and things like that. Uh, but it's something that's a constant threat. So you, you always have to be careful um, with, with what you're carrying. Um, one, I didn't mention it, it's in the report, I didn't mention it in my um, uh, talk, talk, but one of the other things that's helping these days is that increasingly we're now moving from USB memory sticks to micro SD cards. And these are tiny, tiny little cards, right? Um, and a couple of the escapees I talked to um, said that they were easy to do things like you could put them inside your mouth if you got caught. Um, or worse comes to worse, because they're so small and thin, you just snap them in half, even in front of the security officer. Because once it's snapped in half, if you really wanted to put it back together, you could, but I don't think they'd bother just for someone they stopped on the street. So um, technology is helping people, but it constantly have to be afraid of it. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real threat. Stan, you've been very patient. The final question today. Uh, thank you. Um, I was a student in the Soviet Union, and my exposure to this, I remember once the Soviet students in our dorm room, and they were singing the American songs. They were clearly listening. The cultural aspect we have not discussed. Younger people, university people, I, looking back on those days, they wanted to be part of this larger world. They knew it was out there. The culture is a wedge issue. This is particularly the case, it seems to me, for South Korea because it's such a cultural dynamo. And another issue is the family reunification. You know, the family ties could be a way of, you know, bringing South Korea, you mentioned South Korea into the current regime, isn't so receptive, but how can people be opposed to family ties, families visiting each other. That's another wedge issue. So I'll just put that to you. Any comments from the panel? Concur. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, well, <laughs> fantastic to conclude. On that note, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. I'd like to take the opportunity to wish you happy holidays and a very happy new year 2020. I would also like to take the opportunity to wish our colleagues involved in information operations, RFA, VOA, Kim Song Min. Uh, yes, absolutely, <laughs> all of them. Um, the best of luck next year as they proceed with uh, their fight and struggle for freedom and human rights. Um, let me thank Martin Williams for uh, all of the great and hard work he's put into this report. It's turned out to be a terrific HRNK report. I would like to thank all other panelists, uh, Dave, Tom, uh, Mike, for joining us today. Again, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays. See you at the next report release.